My research lies at the intersection of two areas, many body condensed matter physics and quantum information. In condensed matter physics, we're trying to ask the question, what are the possible phases of matter or the emergent phenomena that can arise when you have a complex system of many interacting degrees of freedom, many interacting electrons, ions, but these are all interacting according to the laws of quantum mechanics. A guiding principle of this field is that more is different. The collective behavior of systems of many interacting particles can be much richer. The whole can be much richer than the sum of its parts. Think of a society or, or a colony of ants or a flock of birds. The behavior that these collectives can display is, much, is vastly richer than what we would anticipate by studying any one individual human being or ant or bird. So likewise, systems or societies of many strongly interacting quantum particles can display a rich array of, of collective behaviors. Traditionally, in condensed matter physics, um, when we think about phases of matter, we do this within the framework of equilibrium statistical mechanics or equilibrium thermodynamics. This is the setting where all of our understanding of phases, whether it's like solids, liquids, and gases, or it's kind of more exotic behaviors like superconductors and semiconductors, liquid crystals, basically everything that our modern technological age is based on comes from some understanding of the collective behavior of systems of many strongly interacting electrons. But all of that is within this framework of thermal equilibrium. There's a reason that, that much of our understanding of condensed matter physics was based within this framework of equilibrium thermodynamics. This is the regime that, that historically experiments have had access to. And also, if you want to study the properties of some material that just exists in nature, that exists in a state of equilibrium, so we rely on this framework of equilibrium statistical mechanics to try to address these questions. Now we have access to a whole new class of experiment. Motivated by the, build, by the quest to build new quantum technologies, we've been seeing breakthrough developments in, in our ability to control and engineer systems of many interacting quantum particles. Um, and this is giving us access to complex quantum matter in a very, very different regime. For example, we can probe uh, quantum systems strongly out of equilibrium or interacting uh, in controllable ways and existing in engineered space-time geometries that, that could be non-Euclidean, that simply don't exist out in the wild. So this is giving us access to complex quantum systems in completely new regimes, completely far from the usual frameworks of equilibrium thermodynamics that we have traditionally used to understand phases of matter. So my research is guided by asking what are new phenomena that we can that, that, that exist in these vastly new settings that have been opened up by quantum experiments. Think of an ordinary crystal, like diamond or table salt. Okay, when you think of a crystal, you visualize some periodic regular array of atoms. Now, in, in physics, we tend to think of phases in terms of symmetries. Okay. And a fundamental symmetry of nature is that of translation symmetry. Okay. So if you do an experiment um, here at Stanford campus or you do it in Bangalore, you don't expect to get different answers because the laws of nature are the same everywhere. But if you see a crystal, a crystal breaks this translation symmetry because a crystal has atoms in very definite locations. And if you look between those atoms, it's just empty space. Okay. So think of a stadium where the chairs are arranged in a regular grid, okay? Because it's a regular grid, you have definite locations where those chairs exist. And because those definite locations have picked out some preferred positions in space, um, you've broken this continuous translation symmetry that existed. Contrast that with a liquid or a solid, okay? In which case you look under a microscope, and, and the liquid molecules, they just look like statistically they're the same everywhere. There's no preferred direction. So again, coming back to the stadium example, if you didn't have assigned seating, but everyone was free to mill around however they wanted, then that would be something that looks translationally invariant in contrast to the crystal, which breaks the translation symmetry. So this is ordinary crystals. And now it's natural to ask, well, if we have space crystals, why not time crystals? Okay, because the laws of nature are also translationally invariant in time. 
if I do an experiment today and I do an experiment two years from now, I hope the experiment is reproducible and I get the same answers. Right. So, so this was a question that that Frank Wilczek, a Nobel laureate, was asking. You know, why 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 can't we have time crystals? His proposal was was met with a lot of excitement when he when when he put forward this idea, uh, but just w within a very short period of time, uh, there were various theorems that proved that actually. This, this phase, this time crystal, even though it sounds so so conceptually appealing, uh, that this cannot, this provably cannot exist, okay? But it cannot exist within this framework of equilibrium thermodynamics that we use to understand phases of matter. And why? Well, if you want to get a time crystal, then to break time translation symmetry, you need a phase of matter that's going to show you some kind of motion forever. The other thing about phases is that it should show you that kind of movement or motion forever spontaneously, without any net input of energy. And it should show you this kind of movement, this motion forever. And again, you're talking about collective phases. So you want some system of many, many interacting particles. You're not just going to talk about one single particle that, you know, you can controllably get to show you some oscillations. You need some system of many interacting particles which without any net input of energy is going to show you some collective motion spontaneously forever. Okay, now this starts sounding a lot like a perpetual motion machine, okay, which has been roundly rejected by the laws of equilibrium thermodynamics for, for centuries and, and using kind of more sophisticated but, but kind of fundamentally similar reasoning, you can show that the time crystals are also disallowed by the laws of equilibrium thermodynamics. Time crystal is this striking new example of a new type of non-equilibrium phase of matter. But what I find really exciting is that it's just one example. Okay, uh, these, these new types of experiments, so they're giving us access to all of these new settings fundamentally out of equilibrium in different geometries that we can, we can engineer, non-Euclidean geometries. And, and much of our understanding of physics simply does not extend to these settings. So what I find really exciting is that there's this vast new frontier um, waiting to be understood on, on what new types of phenomena we can get uh, when we have quantum particles interacting in these, in these new types of ways that engineered quantum systems have given us access to. The experimental demonstration of, of time crystals that I was part of um, was actually done in collaboration with the Google quantum AI team. And, you know, they were building this, this chip and, you know, they were using Sycamore to do a, a kind of demonstration of, a, of, a, of a quantum information theoretic task. Uh, and that demonstration had attracted a lot of attention. And meanwhile, I had been thinking about, you know, we have this type of phase of matter, but it only exists in kind of pen and paper. Um, and, and various different experimental groups had been trying to see different aspects of that physics. And, you know, we, and, and, and those experiments had motivated us to ask, what are all the different experimental requirements we would need to actually be able to observe this phase in, in an actual experiment in reality? And then when Google made their announcement, I had been studying the experimental paper and, and I realized that actually all the requirements that I had been, that I had been looking for uh, existed on that, on that platform. So then I got in touch with the Google team and there's a, an effort there to actually use that device just for fundamental physics experiments. Um, and it was a great collaboration and we were able to work with them in order to actually observe this phase. I would say be obsessed. Find a problem that really interests you. Don't worry about whether the problem is important or not important. Just if there's something that you're obsessed by and you can't stop thinking about it and you keep working on it, you will find something new and interesting about it. Every problem, every, every question, if you dig deep enough, has something beautiful. And, but, but in order to dig deep enough, you, you, you have to really be, be obsessed by it. Extremely grateful, very humbled. 
of course, this is not just my work. Uh, this this really was a collective effort with with my collaborators and my mentors, um, and I'm extremely grateful to them and to the Infosys Foundation. And I think it also this you know there's so much amazing work, amazing science happening everywhere. I mean, I can speak to the area in which I work, um, and I think this really is like a a, a recognition of of all of that effort that has made this both theoretically and experimentally such an exciting time in the field. Uh, and I hope it'll encourage um, other young people to to pursue this area. I think it's also really great to see uh, science being recognized and celebrated in, in India. I hope there's much more of that in the world because there's really so much exciting science to to discover. So I I hope this this serves as an encouragement not just to me but also to to future generations of scientists. 